Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of A Conversation with Kami Tang. Today, we are on season three, episode six, and I'm going to be presenting to you a lecture on analypsology, the dogma of transcension. So I hope you enjoy it. Please like the video, comment, tell me what you think, and uh, I'll see you on the other side. So enjoy, guys. Good morning, everybody around the world who are watching today. Um, I'm Kami Tan, and I'm going to be giving this lecture to you today on the dogma of transcension. Um, this is essentially about astronist salvation, this, this topic. And I suppose you may be wondering what that really long word there on the front page means. It's referred to as analypsology which is the study of the dogma of transcension. It's the study of transcension. And essentially what we're trying to say by exploring this today is we're trying to understand why transcension is a dogma, why it was classified as a dogma by the Astronist Institution in 2021, um, what that means, what, what that classification of dogma actually means in astronism, because it doesn't mean the same thing exactly uh as in as in other religions perhaps and also uh we're going to be just picking apart what this concept of transcension means essentially transcension embodies the astronist belief that the astronomical world and by extension space exploration uh will bring about the salvation of humankind and so that is the fundamental notion of of transcension and that's what we're going to pick apart today so just a little side note before we begin, the contents that was that was the content of this lecture, sorry, um, is of both interdoxical and astrodoxical origin. And what I mean by that is that part of the contents um, will actually be published as part of the astrodoxy, which is the upcoming treatise that I'm actually writing right now. So you're actually kind of getting a, a bit of a sneak preview uh, this morning um, of some astrodoxical uh, content. Uh, and then the rest and then the, all the all the other um, parts of of the, um, the lecture are of interdoxical uh, origin, that meaning uh, they emerged between my writing of the Omnidoxy and my writing now of the Astrodoxy. OK, so just to get that clear um, and then now we can begin. So. The fundamental sort of question that transcension gets people to think about is the question of can space save us? And this is what our first section here is going to really try to unpack. Um, this question, you could say, might be quite a radical idea, uh, maybe seen as quite strange um, and, and quite weird. Uh, but for astronauts, this is a very normal idea. It is a very um, it, it is an idea that is grounded in our worldview of cosmocentrism, which I'm going to be speaking about a little bit later on. Um, but I think that this question really underpins uh, the whole idea of transcension and the whole study of analypsology, because it, it, it is based on the idea that, that space, outer space, and humanity's exploration of space will bring about the salvation of humankind, but also it can be, uh, additional words could be added to that, to that question, and you could say, how can space save us? Why can space save us? And then you start to open up the, the more ideas and more questions about transcension. Um, and, and that's kind of the goal, really, of analypsology, which we're going to be speaking about in a little in a short while. But to really understand the validity of this question. So can space save us? Can we really gain a type of salvation from the astronomical world and its exploration? We really have to understand first what analypsology is. So analypsology is formed from the word analepsis, which means, I presume that's from Greek, uh, and it means ascension into heaven. Uh, and of course, what I'm referring to there when I say heaven is the, is the physical astronomical world. That is not a spiritual place as of yet. Um, in other aspects of astronism, you may see the astronomical world in a kind of spiritual 
uh, understanding, which is what I've spoken about previously. But in this context, we're talking about the physical astronomical world. Uh, but that's what analepsis means. And then, of course, by adding the uh, suffix ology onto that, you come out with the, um, the meaning of a discipline of study that, um, that deals with ascension into the astronomical world, essentially. And so therefore, analypsology is the study of this process of ascending into the astronomical world and is therefore the study of the process of transcension. So analypsology is a branch of what we call astrosoteriology. OK, you may have heard astros, you may have heard soteriology elsewhere. It's a Christian term uh, and it's also used in other religions as well to refer to traditions of salvation or doctrines of salvation. And astronism uh, has its own soteriology. Uh, of course, transcension is a core part of that soteriology, but um, it is just one part of it. And so analypsology and astrosoteriology are not synonymous. Uh, analypsology is a branch of astrosoteriology. And essentially what analypsology intends to do is to explore the functions, the nature of transcension and how it may be attained and, and trying to explore the validity of transcension essentially. So analypsology really is about the rational investigation of this astronist dogma of transcension, essentially that the astronomical world and the endeavor of space exploration possess salvific functions. OK, and um, of course, also, that means that analypsology studies salvation. It studies what salvation means. It kind of wants to compare what. Christian understandings of salvation are with what astronist understandings of salvation are uh, salvation is um, and of course that emerges in what we call transcension and so the aim of analypsology really is to analyze transcension to rationalize it to criticize it and to explicate it to explain it to to present it like I'm doing today in many ways but analypsology is not only a discipline of um, that studies transcension, but it is itself the dogma of transcension. Um, and what I mean by that is that even though analypsology criticizes transcension from time to time, it is it is itself the dogma of transcension and it, and it, it recognizes transcension as an astronomist dogma and then kind of proceeds to explore it in every way possible by questioning transcension, by supporting it, and if needs be, by rejecting parts of it, if, if that comes down to making transcension better, if that's what has to be done to make it better, then that's what analypsologists will do. Um, and, I can, and I think with that, we kind of come to the, the overall aim really of analypsology, which is to make the best version of transcension possible. Uh, astronism has always been about creating new ideas, but also building on old ideas, creating the best of ideas uh, and in regards to transcension, that is the same. Uh, we, the purpose of analypsology, the purpose of developing this discipline of study is to make transcension the, most po the best possible version of itself that it can be. Um, and I think in that sense, what we need to kind of explain, what I need to kind of explain to you all uh, at the beginning really is the difference between what a dogma is and what a doctrine is. Because you may be wondering, well, if it's a dogma and analypsology is allowed to reject parts of it, um, you know, is it really dogma then? Because a dogma in astronism is, is something that is incontrovertible. So it, it, it is absolute. So um, transcension, the essence of it, not all of it, because transcension is gigantic. There's hundreds of concepts and ideas and beliefs that form transcension, okay? So we're not saying all of those are incontrovertible. Some of them may be doctrines, so they may be asserted as true, um, but the only thing that is regarded as incontrovertible, so unable to be, um, unable to be disproven or unable to be um, 
rejected in its totality is the essence of transcension, that fundamental idea that the astronomical world and by extension space exploration bring about salvation and that, and that that process of transcension will do that for humanity, will bring about salvation. That's what the dogma of transcension is referring to. Um, and, and so when I'm saying analypsology wants to make that better, I'm talking about all the different parts that make transcension. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I say reject parts of transcension, not that fundamental essence, because that can't be rejected because it's referred to as incontrovertible. Uh, because it is a dogma, uh, but certainly the parts around transcension, namely how we go about transcension, uh, the different natures of it, methods of transcension, all those things are either doctrine or are um, just general beliefs. Um, and so they can be changed uh, and they do develop with time. OK, so that's that's the difference there. And so um, that's kind of the aim, really, of analypsology is to make the best possible version of transcension. Um, there are a couple of other sort of words that we may you, you may see thrown around to refer to analypsology. They are transcendology, transcendology, sorry, and um, sensiology. And then also for transcension, you may see the word diascension being used sometimes. Sometimes I use that. Um, and these are just some words that we sort of bring about, you know, to try and, and give a little bit of variety. So we're not always using the same words all the time. Um, analyptic, of course, from analypsis or analypsology uh, is the adjective that refers to anything relating to transcension. Um, and so you can use that really for anything in relation to transcension. Uh, the, the word analypsis you can use for transcension. It is valid to use for transcension, but it's more referred to as a personal form of transcension, uh, which is, of course, what we refer to as astrosis. Uh, you can take a look at some of my past lectures where I've mentioned astrosis. Astrosis is the personal form of transcension. Uh, by default, usually by default, unless I say otherwise, when I'm talking about transcension i'm talking about the salvation of all humankind rather than individual transcension okay if i'm talking about individual transcension i would usually use the word astrosis or analypsis okay uh, but you can use the word analypsis uh, there's no rules to say you can't but the general consensus is that it's for personal transcension okay um then we come to as now that we've sort of got a general idea about what transcension is and the sort of fundamentals of it, we know a few of the different words that we use to refer to it. We begin now to open up to one of the first concepts of transcension, which is the, the idea of a plan of transcension. OK, so a plan of transcension is a rationally ordered method I spoke about methods in the last slide, if you remember, um, by which transcension is regarded to be achieved or achievable. OK, so um, the plan of transcension concept includes within it a lot of other different ideas. So it could be something that is destined to occur. You know, you could you could bring that into it, you know, or, or it could be something that is divinely prescribed. There are branches of transcension that believe um, or assert that 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 God is is bringing about transcension and that God has a plan of transcension for humanity. Uh, and essentially what I'm trying to say with that that phrase plan of transcension is that transcension needs to be something that is um that is carefully managed and we're going to get a bit we're going to get into that a lot more a little bit later um it is something that has to have a method behind it it is something that needs to be um rationally um strategically thought about it is not something that will just happen um perhaps you know like it's not like a perhaps it's not a it's not a perhaps it will it will take place uh you know it it is it is something that will have to be managed okay and with the idea of the plan of transcension we're beginning to introduce what transcension entails okay but before we get into that, because that will come a little bit later on in the lecture, um, 
we come to this idea of perinism. Okay, this is new, another new word. So there'll be a lot of new words that you come across in this lecture. And one of them is perinism. Perinism is, you could say, the belief that rests as sort of the, uh, as sort of the underlying uh, principle of transcension, the underlying belief of transcension. Um, and essentially what it states, it, it kind of has sort of two branches really. It, it states the belief that the astronomical world is either a source of salvation or the only source of salvation, okay? And this rests really at the at the at the fundamental level of what transcension is. Um, the astronomical world is therefore regarded as, I mean, I regard the astronomical world as the only source of transcension um, or salvation. Um, and of course, uh, other people may think it's just one source. So you can see the difference there between the two uh, schools of thought, um, but. Fundamentally, what Perinism is trying to say is that salvation is not brought about by space exploration, but, but that salvation exists in the physical astronomical world. And that is the difference, that salvation resides as a fundamental aspect of the astronomical world. So the astronomical world is the source, sorry, of salvation um space exploration and space expansion is the vehicle of salvation of transcension and then humanity is the beneficiary of salvation okay and that's the difference between how we see you know these um three different aspects of perinism um so essentially what we need to the only the main thing we have to look at for this is that the astronomical world is the is 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 itself the source of salvation. It's not it, space exploration is what brings the astronomical world to humanity. It's what allows humanity to venture out into the astronomical world and then potentialize itself. That's what allows it to do it. So that's why it's the vehicle. But it is the astronomical world itself that is the source of this deliverance of this salvation okay and that's the main thing to come across with perinism and that is the underlying belief of uh transcension transcension wouldn't exist as it does in in astronism if this belief uh were not correct or were not true or did not exist so perinism and and, and like i said earlier this may come across as quite a strange belief uh, something that is um, maybe quite um, radical, maybe for some people, especially those who have been brought up with the idea that, you know, God brings about salvation and, and God is the only one to give salvation. And we're saying, well, no, it's the astronomical world that is actually the source of that for humanity. That's where we're going to get our salvation from. Um, but but really, this, this belief in Perinism, this belief that we refer to as Perinism, is, is based really on the astronist worldview of cosmocentrism. And it is it is a very logical idea, really, that has emerged from um, the cosmocentric worldview, because the cosmocentric worldview states that outer space is the most important place in existence for humanity and for any other species in the in, in the cosmos um and that really space and that really perinism the belief in perinism is the product of cosmocentrism okay it is the product of cosmocentrism when when cosmocentrism is applied to salvation okay to the concept of salvation that this is produced Perinism, okay? Um, so when you think about it like that, and you can come from the astronomist perspective to say, well, the astronomical world is the most important thing. The astronomical world then is also what brings about salvation. So you can kind of understand why that is so important um, there and why it rests at the foundations of transcension. So Perinism sees the astronomical world as the realm vast enough to allow for the scope of humankind to be realized. 
Now, when we get into the idea of scope, we're coming into this idea of opportunity, okay? Sometimes we refer to scope as the governing concept of astronism. Uh, it's the governing, it's the foundational concept of astronism. It's this idea of opportunity. Um, we're, gonna come, uh, we're gonna come to that a little bit later on because it's connected to how astronists see salvation and how they see what salvation is and how I see what salvation is. Um, but essentially for now, just understand that yes, per Perinism sees the astronomical world as, the, as, the, as that is the environment that is vast enough, that is the place that is big enough, that is vast enough to allow humanity to potentialize itself, to be to fulfill its potential, okay? And that and that the earth alone is not vast enough to do that, okay? It's not vast enough to do that. There are a myriad of um, ways of viewing Perinism. Um, for example, most astronists, including myself, regard space exploration as the only way to undertake transcension, while others may take a non-cosmocentric view and may say, well, transcension can be conducted without space exploration, uh, that you can still observe the astronomical world and still achieve transcension by staying on the Earth. Now, I don't believe that and I think it's a core aspect of transcension to believe that it's not dogma uh, but it is um, and that's why people can have different views on it but um, essentially what those types of people are saying is well staying on the earth for now is the best way to go about transcension and I just don't agree with that I respect their views but I just don't agree with that and I don't think that that's the best way to go about transcension at this stage. So now we understand kind of that fundamental belief that rests at, at the sort of the basis of transcension. Um, it might be a good idea now to kind of just explore what transcension is itself, because I keep on using this word and we know that, that it's about astronaut salvation, it's salvation in the astronomical world, it's kind of this sort of reaching the ultimate condition of ourselves, potentializing ourselves, fulfilling uh, our, our potential as, uh, you know, as a species, um, but transcension itself is actually an extensive and complex process that astronism asserts will lead to the salvation or redemption of humankind. Okay, so this is a this is not a simple process. That is this is not a process that will take place overnight, and it is not a process that will that will be easy. It will be a struggle, and it will be very difficult. Um, and I think that's the only way to achieve salvation is through a process. You know, if we're talking about the salvation of humanity, that is a huge idea. And even getting to the ultimate condition of humanity, that is a huge idea. So we need a huge process, a very complex and extensive process to help us get there. OK, uh, the things that we're talking about here are very grand and very large and, and extensive. So we need a process that is also equally and more so extensive. OK. So transcension is the astronist interpretation of what saving humanity means, okay? And this is kind of what we're trying to get down to when we're talking about can space save us from the beginning of this section is, you know, is understanding what saving means, okay? I think, well, in, in astronism, what saving humanity means and so what's and what salvation means in astronism is potentializing humanity. It's not a it's not a moral salvation. So transcension will not bring about a moral. I mean, you could say it could. It has a moral aspect to it. It definitely has a moral aspect to it. But what we're talking about when we're saying reaching the ultimation or reaching transcension is we're talking about a physical, intellectual and a spiritual slash mystical um, salvation. We're not necessarily talking about a moral salvation as the centerpiece, which is, of course, how Christians view salvation. OK, um, but transcension really embodies humanity's struggle. It, it is humanity's struggle to reach its ultimate condition. And really what with 
the idea of can space save us, we also have to ask ourselves another question. And that is, what is our ultimate condition as a species? What, what ultimate state can we reach as a species, but also as individuals? And this is what transcension is trying to get us to think about, okay? Um, and of course, reaching, according to Astronist Doctrine, reaching that condition, reaching that ultimate state is intertwined with space exploration because of astronism's cosmocentric orientation or, or its cosmocentric worldview, okay? Um, and indeed, transcension constitutes a sequence of events. You know, this is not just one event or one process that we're talking about here. I'm talking about multitude of processes, a multitude of, of states of being, a multitude of conditions that will that will span thousands of years, I think. Um, and of course, these processes are also multidimensional. They can take place in a spiritual essence. They will take um, take place on a physical level, an intellectual level, a mystical level, um, but also at the same time, those different levels are multidimensional themselves, because we can talk about individual transcension and collective transcension. So you can see there how, and, 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 and on top of all that, there's many different themes of transcension, methods of transcension. So not to overdo it for you, but what I'm trying to, to demonstrate here is that transcension is a huge process. It is not something that is simple, it is multidimensional, multifaceted, um, and works for the individual. And, you know, because, because we're not going to see this ultimate state. When I'm talking about achieving transcension, achieving trans transcension or the ultimate condition, obviously I'm not going to see that because I'll be gone. I'll be long gone. And, and so will the people who are watching this video right now. So, again, transcension is about doing things for the future, for future generations, for future humanity. Uh, but it can also relate to and does relate to the individual, you know, transcension during our lifetime. And that's why we refer to things like astrosis um, and sort of that union with the cosmos during our lifetime, uh, which is kind of another branch of transcension, um, kind of a separate branch, really. But what we also need to remember is that individual astroses, so individual transcensions, contribute to uh, and are really crucial for the achievement of, of collective transcension, of the transcension of, of humanity as a whole, okay? So the goal of transcension is to get humanity to reach its highest possible condition. And we call this the ultimation. Um, I was gonna talk about this a little bit later on, but I think I'll talk about it now. I've never really defined what the ultimation is. Um, I've always left it kind of ambiguous. I do have my own personal beliefs and ideas, and I do talk about what ultimation could be, but I've never made it doctrine um, because we don't know. We don't know what this ultimate condition of humanity is. Things that I might say are the ultimate condition of humanity may not be the ultimate condition in a thousand years time because we may have already reached them. So anything that I say would be the ultimate condition of humanity um, is only going to be said from my uh, very, um, you know, small minded perspective um, here on the earth. So, you know, there's no much point in me. Um, talking too much about what the ultimation is. This is why I place an emphasis on its realization later on down the line. Um, but certainly, the ultimation could be transcosmization. It could be. It could be um, becoming godlike, or it could be. Um, transcending the cosmic periphery or something like that or becoming an infinite species or immortal something like that it could be those things and they're great ideas to think about a lot of my transhumanist friends think about those ideas and they're great to think about but i think for right now and when we're talking about transcension in the moment um we don't know we don't know what the ultimate condition of humanity is that's the beauty of it because humanity has so much scope, so much potential, we don't know what the ultimate condition is yet. 
but we have to embark upon transcension in order to find out what that is. Do you get what I'm saying? So reaching the ultimation is therefore contingent on us embarking on transcension now, you know? So in understanding transcension a little bit more now, we can come to try to understand its validity. Is transcension a valid path to the ultimation, to ultimation? Okay. And, and in this sense, I'm kind of beginning to use the word ultimation, um, meaning the ultimate condition of humanity, um, in place of the word salvation, because salvation is a very Christian word. And I still use it, you know, it's still valid. It's still the same type of thing that I'm talking about. Uh, but I think ultimation is more of an astronist term. And it's more specific to the type of salvation that I'm referring to when I'm, when I'm talking about what transcension can achieve. Um, I think in asking this question of transcension, we need to understand how astronism interprets what salvation is. And for this, we must consult the narrative of the astrosoteriology. So in astronism, salvation is regarded to equate to potentialization. So reaching um, humanity's potential, fulfilling the opportunity um, the opportunities that humanity has received, okay? This is what we refer to as potentialization, okay? Of course, we refer to scope, uh, we refer to opportunity, the word opportunity as scope. Um, you'll see that word referenced throughout astronist books and lectures and all sorts of anything that I produce. Um, and really, that is the sort of opportunity that we have to embark upon transcension, to potentialize ourselves individually, but also humanity collectively. So essentially, scope provides the means for salvation, the means for the ultimation. If it wasn't for scope, if it wasn't for the opportunities that we have to achieve the ultimation, uh, we wouldn't be able to embark upon transcension. We wouldn't be able to embark upon the journey to ultimation. OK, so scope provides the means for that. It provides the tools, the ideas, the opportunity for that. OK, and it is for this reason that the astrosoteriology asserts that humanity saves itself. This is what we call extrication. I know it can be a little bit difficult to read there, but that says extrication in brackets there. Um, this is because the onus is on humanity to fulfill the scope afforded to it in order to then achieve ultimation. OK, so. The, the idea that humanity saves itself is what we call extrication. This is very, very different from, for example, Christianity, where Jesus brought about the means for salvation, but it was also the achiever of salvation. Of course, humans still have to do something. They still have to be morally good. They have to focus on... Um, you know, practicing the Christian religion as it is prescribed to achieve salvation, uh, but but really kind of salvation has been put on a plate for them. You know, it's, it's there. Jesus has done all the work to bring about salvation. They just have to fulfill their end of the bargain. Whereas in astronism, it's a little bit different. We kind of have to do all the work. Yes, we have scope, which is the means for salvation. We have the tools for salvation uh, or part of the tools for salvation. But we definitely don't have everything. And we are, and salvation is definitely not something that is guaranteed. Uh, you could say that in Christianity, salvation is, is guaranteed because it's already taken place. Um, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus have already taken place. And so therefore salvation is, is kind of guaranteed as long as you do your part. Part, whereas in astronism, you don't even get that guarantee. Um, you don't even get the guarantee that salvation is there. You know, this is, it's, it's a much more precarious situation in transcension in, in astronism with regards to salvation than in perhaps Christianity, for example. And so this idea of humanity having to save itself, having to bring about its own salvation is what we call extrication. Okay.
So transcension saves humanity through hum humanity's potentialization. We understand this now. It's not just about being a morally good person, even though that's definitely part of it. It's about potentializing. We don't really use the ideas of morality in astronism in that way. We're not saying that it's bad, but we're just saying that it's not really part of achieving transcension. OK, part of achieving transcension or central to it is this process of potentialization getting those opportunities and harnessing those and harnessing the scope that has been afforded to us. And I know that might seem very vague and quite ambiguous. Um, and again, that's part of this process of extrication, saving ourselves. We kind of have to understand, we're kind of working blind really, you know, um, there, isn't, there isn't this sort of prescription of what, what saving ourselves is. Um, I'm just providing you with the idea that it's in at the astronomical world from my cosmocentric perspective, that that is what will bring about salvation. Um, but it's a lot more precarious situation. I hope that when I hope that as transcension actually becomes physical in the world and starts to be embarked upon that this sort of journey to, to salvation and what individuals need to do in their lives uh, to achieve transcension will become a lot more clear. Uh, but at this stage, it remains still very, very sort of precarious. Sometimes I have scope in front of me, I have opportunities, and sometimes I don't know which one to choose. Um, I always tend to choose the one that sort of seems connected to the astronomical world because I have this cosmocentric worldview that seems to be the right way uh, for me. Um, but again, it still seems quite ambiguous. Um, but hopefully as time goes on, the understanding of what transcension is and how that can be brought about um, will develop. And, and, it, and it will do, it will develop. Um, as, and then this is why analypsology is so important. This is why the discipline of it is so important because we have to understand, um, we have to develop the concept of transcension in order to help it improve people's lives and help people get to salvation um, in an easier way than, than perhaps that I will be able to because it's not as developed yet, you know, because the concept isn't as developed. So we've got, this idea of scope, and uh, we've got this idea of the, the extrication, saving ourselves, potentialization, which is the fulfilling of that scope. Um, and of course, transcension is this sort of embodiment of, of, of fulfilling a scope, it's that process. Um, and so fulfilling scope does the work of salvation for astronauts, both individually and for all humanity. And essentially, therefore, scope is the function of transcension that achieves ultimation. OK, astronism then asserts the doctrine of perinism, which intertwines transcension with space exploration. We're used to this now. We've already covered perinism, but that's how it slots in there. So you could say, I mean, uh, for the most part on this slide, I've not really mentioned much about space exploration. I've, I've mentioned about scope, I've mentioned about extrication, you know, the idea that we have to save ourselves. I've mentioned about filling our, fulfilling our potential, things like that, but I've not really mentioned space exploration until the very end. That's where perinism comes in because it sees the potentialization of humanity as intertwined with space exploration intertwined with the astronomical world and what is taking place up there and the fact that we need to be up there in order to harness that type of uh, salvation. And so as we continue on now with this sort of exploring the validity of transcension, we have these four uh, categories again, these sort of four dimensions of the rationale for transcension. Um, and as you can notice there, they are split between the collectivistic and the individualistic. The physical aspects of transcension seem to be, always be a little bit more on the collectivistic side. You know, they're referring to all humanity rather than individuals. And then you've got sort of the more spiritual and mystical sides. Uh, they are 
markedly more individualistic, uh, talking about sort of astrosis, astral mysticism, things like that. Um, and then you've got the intellectual sides, which you could say is the one that is split between the individualistic and the collectivistic side. So you've got these four dimensions of the rationale for transcension. And essentially what these are doing is, is they're just providing a, um, a rationale really for why transcension is important, why we need to undertake transcension. Um, but, and you can pause the slide now and just take a look at those different dimensions. I'm not going to go through them all, um, but because I think you can kind of get the general gist of them. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to, to make clear uh, that I've put at the bottom there is that I'm not just advocating for space exploration here. Um, someone said to me recently, I was talking a lot about space exploration and, and, and connecting that to transcension. Um, and they were saying, well, space exploration is taking place. I don't know why you're so bothered about, you know, why you're so concerned about space exploration. It is, we're, we're doing space exploration. And I said, yes, we are, and that's great, but we're not doing transcension and we're not doing the transcension in the way that, that the Astronist Institution sees uh, that we should be in, and how astronauts see transcension on being undertaken. Um, I'm not just advocating for space exploration. It may seem that way because transcension is intertwined with space exploration. It's a major theme of transcension. Um, but, but no, transcension is not all just about space exploration and I'm not just advocating for space exploration i am advocating for transcension which just so happens to be intertwined with space exploration and that's the difference there um, and so of course you've got those four different dimensions you can take a look at those um, they're essentially just providing a kind of of understanding you know of, of, of why transcension is important and why we feel like we need to focus on it so uh, moving away now from sort of that introductory section one and now moving into section two, we can we can dive a little deeper into transcension, what that means, astronaut salvation, and of course, what the ultimation is. So in understanding and exploring transcension, I came across new ideas for what salvation is and also of course, as part of analypsology is exploring the nature of transcension. In doing so, I then came across the ideas of linear salvation and prospective salvation. OK, linear salvation is and, and these are both characteristic of transcension, of the form of salvation that transcension embodies. OK. Uh, the first one of those, which is, of course, linear salvation, um, is contrasted with cyclical salvation. Linear salvation is talking about salvation on a direct path upwards. OK, transcension is all about ascension into the astronomical world. OK, it's all about um, that physical lifting upwards, that physical direction upwards, um, and it is not a cyclical process. Uh, yes, you can come, you know, we could make some strides in transcension, get out into the astronomical world, but then take kind of two steps back along that progression. That could happen, uh, but but it's not a cyclical process, is what I'm trying to say. Astronism is not, um, sorry, transcension is not a cyclical process. It is a linear one. Either we're going towards transcension or we're coming away from transcension. Um, and that's how I understand uh, the nature of of, of uh, transcension and that and that um, that really sort of contrasts with a lot of the Dharmic religions, the Indian religions of um, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, 
their soteriologies, their sal uh, theories of salvation are very much more cyclical. You know, they have the idea of samsara, um, karma, um, reincarnation, things like that, that, that bring about salvation eventually. These are very cyclical um, orientations for salvation. Uh, transcension is not that. Transcension is linear. Uh, it is not cyclical. It doesn't go in cycles. It is a linear process, okay? Uh, and you could say the similar sense for Christianity in that way, uh, but then uh, the form of uh, and then transcension in the second um, aspect here is what we call prospective salvation. Um, the transcension very much departs from the Christian understanding of salvation, because in Christianity, Jesus was the means and achiever of salvation, but the events that brought about Christian salvation have already taken place. And that's what we call retrospective salvation. Yes, you still as individuals have to um, bring about your own individual salvation, but the salvation of humanity has already taken place uh, through the cru crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So and that has already happened 2000 years ago. So that is retrospective. OK, that is a retrospective form of salvation. It's different for transcension. Transcension is a prospective. We're talking about the future here. Salvation still hasn't been achieved. Salvation, therefore, still isn't guaranteed in astronism. OK, this is we're talking about the future. We're talking about prospective forms of salvation. Um, and of course, astronism has a fluid nature. You know, these retrospective people can have cyclical and retrospective conceptions of transcension. That's fine, um, because, like I said at the beginning, the essence of transcension is dogma, but all the things around it are doctrines. So that's the difference. And you can explore the doctrines and, and move around with them and, and chop and change them and, and think of new ways of approaching transcension. And this is this is kind of what I'm speaking about when I'm saying these are doctrines, but they're not dogma, okay? Um, and that's how the process of transcension differs from that of um, salvation in other religions. So it's very much different from the Dharmic understanding of, of salvation, and it's very much different in another way from the Christian concept of salvation, okay? Like I've said previously, the process of transcension is long and convoluted. It is extensive and complex, and it is formed by many actions and phenomena. Now, two important aspects that, that I like to always include here are what we refer to as analytic channels. These are actions that a person or all humanity may conduct in an effort to come closer to achieving transcension or some part of transcension. Uh, and essentially what just analytic channels are, are making use of scope for transcension. That's what, well, that's what a channel is. It allows you to progress um, towards your astrosis or for humanity to progress towards transcension. Uh, and then we also have what we call analytic agency, which can be seen as a little bit controversial, but I don't think it is. I think it, it, it just is a product of an analypsocentric worldview. Um, so analytic agency is when astronism views concepts like God, the soul, the afterlife, and any other sort of traditional religious ideas as being agents in achieving transcension. OK, this emerges from what we call analypsocentrism, OK, which is placing a centrality on transcension, essentially on the dogma of transcension. OK, um, and so in that sense, transcension becomes, you know, the, the, the hierarchy of beliefs is subverted and transcension resides at the top. Transcension becomes the most important endeavor, the most important thing to think about. And then these other ideas like God, the soul, the afterlife and other, other ideas um, are agents of that. So God helps to bring about transcension. Um, the soul is integrated with transcension to some degree in some various schools of astronism and so is the afterlife as well um, and and that's where we kind of think about things like achieving astrosis is contingent on 
having an afterlife, okay? So those types of things are integrated with transcension, but transcension is seen as, you know, the ultimate goal. And these other concepts that in other religions may be the ultimate goal are actually just agents of transcension. They are mere parts of transcension. They are bring, helping to bring about transcension, essentially, but they are not themselves the most important thing and they are not the the ultimate goal if you will so the forms of transcension um are quite interesting there's quite a lot of themes that are emerging in transcension particularly in my writing of the omnidoxy i'm exploring things at the moment like seeing transcension as purification or seeing transcension as advancement these are what we refer, refer to as analytic themes different ways that you could understand transcension okay these are emerging and so have many different forms of transcension um, but ultimately, in sort of exploring all these different ideas and, and understanding that transcension is multiplying, really, with the amount of ideas that are part of it, um, in a way, you can kind of lose a little bit of what the simple idea of transcension is. And that first bullet point there at the top kind of captures that again. And it says the word transcension originates from that of ascension which of course denotes a movement upwards. So this is essentially what we're talking about with transcension. We're saying that salvation is contingent upon a movement upwards, elevation. We're gonna speak about a little bit later on about elevation of man, the elevation of humanity. And that's what transcension, the essence of it is referring to. And that's what of course we regard to be dogma. So similar to uh, the analytic channels idea that I referred to on the previous slide, we have what we call pathways or analytic pathways. These are a kind of series of opportunities. These are a series of scopes that when in sequence, that when actioned in sequence come to progress one's achievement of astrosis or all transcension, okay? These are, and you can see these, these are pathways. These are clear sort of uh, pathways. An example of one of these was my founding of astronism. Uh, I saw that as a pathway to achieving a higher condition for myself. Of course, I'm still on that pathway, but certainly I feel like I'm a lot closer to achieving astrosis than if I had let that opportunity go, if I'd let that scope pass me by and I'd never founded astronism. OK, um, so these pathways to transcension are they can be sort of very in your face, you know, they can be very sort of um, you know, clear, but then other ones can be quite uh, more ambiguous. Uh, you're not kind of sure where they'll lead, but they certainly have some type of connection to transcension or astrosis. Okay. So that's what we refer to as pathways. These are a sequence of scopes, essentially, that lead to transcension. So um, as I said previously, you know, transcension can be understood or can take place in a physical sense, a spiritual one, an intellectual one, and a mystical one. And, and, and of course, a person could achieve sort of a physical transcension, but their spiritual and mystical sides of transcension may still be lacking. And so maybe they need to look towards that uh, before they pass on uh, into the next, into, you know, the next life or into a post corporeal existence. Um, maybe they need to look at that. Maybe they need to look at the spiritual side for them. Um, so again, these different forms of transcension, these different dimensions of it, reveal the huge process that transcension is and that it's not simple it is something that is significant to undertake takes many many years and may not be finished in your own lifetime i hope so for most people but may not be and so that's a reality that we have to accept for each of ourselves um and so i think what what that demonstrates really there at the bottom of the slide there is, is saying that there is significant scope within the process of transcension itself, you know, trans and, th and again, this links back to the aims of analypsology, you know, expounding transcension as much as we can, exploring it, um, expanding it as much as we can, you know, that demonstrates that there is significant opportunity that rests within this concept of transcension, there's significant scope that exists there. 
um, that that we can bring about uh, through transcension, through an ellipsological uh, study. So not to go too deep further into transcension as, uh, because there's so much more we need to cover, but there are four main states of transcension. These are called pre-transcension, elevation, transcension, and ultimation, or, or yeah, ultimation, that's how you pronounce that. Uh, um, and these, and, and at the moment, we are at this pre transcension stage. Okay, we've not embarked upon transcension yet. Uh, we still have a lot to do in order to get there, but we will get there. Um, you know, we're just not at that stage yet. We have really these sort of four different states, these four different parts of, of the process of transcension. Um, we don't, I don't know how long it will take us to get to these different parts. I don't, I'm not sure about that. I believe that we will. I have faith that we will. And this is kind of where a little bit of faith has to come in. Uh, you have to have faith and hope that we, that we will achieve these, these different uh, later stages of transcension. Uh, but they're not guaranteed and they need to be managed and they and as i've said before you know they are evitable they are um optional they are not something that is uh definite to occur in my perspective um and so you you can pause the slide now and take a little look at those four states and again, a similar slide here, we've got the four dimensions of transcension. So, of course, we have the four states, which are sort of conditions. They are stages of transcension. And these what we refer to as dynamics of transcension. These are processes. OK, these are processes within transcension. So we've got scopation, placementation, transcension itself which exists within transcension. I know it seems quite complicated, uh, but it is complicated. Uh, and then veltization. Um, so these are the four main dynamics, the four main processes uh, that will take place as part of transcension. With these dynamics, we're actually on the second one or just before the second one, you could say, um, which is placementation, because we already have the scope. We already have the complements of astronality, scope, and stellar C. We already have those. Uh, and so the process of transcension has gone a little bit of the way. Um, you know, we're not totally um, starting from the beginning, uh, but certainly we've got a long way to go. And these different processes and stages of transcension demonstrate that and, 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 really what they what those states and those dynamics and processes show us and what they kind of feed into is this great uh framework which is the major ast major major asterisk mechanism three which refers to entire astronism or um the entire soteriology and eschatology and partly also the theology of astronism um obviously this is you know huge it is such a massive uh, thing to try to explain but as we begin i just want to do it i'm not going to explain all of it but i do i'm just going to have to um try and zoom in here because there's so much to explore there is so so much to explore uh and obviously it is just impossible to explore all of it um Oh, no, one, let me zoom in. Um, so, of course, here, beginning at the, at the start, though, we've got um, we've got the Comet of Life. And then you can see how it's kind of built as a kind of flow chart. You know, you can see the, the scope of man and you can learn about all these terms. Go to the Institutional Dictionary of Astronism. They're all in there. You'll be able to understand them as you go along and, and understand the different uh, processes. Uh, this is also available on astronism.com in a very HD format. So you'd be able to really zoom in on, on some of those, uh, like the, you know, some of these really small texts here. You'll be able to zoom in and take a look at uh, the details of it. Uh, but essentially, you can see that we're beginning with this comet of life idea and then we're moving up. You can see the arrows, you know, it's like a flow chart. Uh, and, and then that way it's quite simple, you know, it's moving along and then we come to this red part, red part. And of course, um, 
And of course, we're moving upwards because because that is a the theme of transcension, isn't it? Moving uh, that upward movement is the process of transcension. So that's why um, a lot of the uh, the green and the good stuff, like the, the 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 pinky and purple kind of stuff, is is color coded in that way because that's lifting us up. It's part of transcension, okay. Whereas the red stuff is not so good, so that's why it comes down or is or is affecting or bringing back or, or holding back. Sorry, uh, some of the processes that are in uh, pink. So. You can see that there's a flow chart there. We're moving up. Um, we're currently at the controversial stage. So we're currently where that orange or yellowy kind of uh, circle is. Uh, we're there at the moment. And then if I move this up slightly again, um, you can see that it kind of splits up, doesn't it? It goes into kind of two columns. Well, the left-hand column is talking about individual transcension. And then the right hand column is talking about humanity's transcension as a whole. So as you can see there, um, I've had to split it into two uh, because of the nature of transcension, that it acts in both individual ways and in uh, collective ways. OK. And then you've got the, the, the confirmants there. You've got astronality, propellant, scope, merited scope, stellancy and all these great things. And then we move up here, which this is obviously on the left hand side. So this is talking about the individual's journey with transcension and all the different parts. And then, of course, we have death there. So as we move up, this is talking about the afterlife, um, a kind of uh, post corporeal existence and how that interprets, you know, how that involves transcension. And then, of course, as we get to the top there, we come to the ultimation. As you can see, the ultimation goes across and, and covers that whole top part of the of the uh, part of the top layer there, um, because ultimately, whether you are in the individual or we're talking about in terms of all humanity, we will end up at the ultimation eventually. OK, so we'll all end up in the same place. It's just that sometimes we're talking in the individual sense and other times we're talking about in the collective sense. So on this right hand side, uh, which is, of course, talking about the collective sense, we're talking about the degradation, which is if we don't embark on transcension and what things will take place with that. Uh, we call that the degradation. Uh, you've got the mechanism key on the right, far right hand side there. That's in grey, just to demonstrate that it's not really to do with, you know, it's separate from everything else. This is just giving you sort of that more information, really. And then, of course, this purple and then dark purple, um, these are exploring what transcension is, the different aspects of it. Uh, and then transcension there. The dark purple is when transcension or the state of transcension has been achieved. Um, and then, of course, eventually we lead up to the ultimation. You might see there right, right at the top, we have the divine. And so that's speaking about how the divine may hold um, influence over these processes that we're talking about. And of course, there you've got intervenience, which is how the divine goes about that type of um, how the divine goes about that type of influence on this process. Uh, but just the final thing to explore on this major astronomist mechanism three is that whether you're an individual, so we'll go back to these columns, whether you're an individual or whether you talk about humanity as a whole, um, time is still going on. And if you look right to the right, left hand side here, you've got time there in the bottom left hand corner. OK, so time is still going on. Time is still taking place. OK, and of course, this blue, the, the sort of blue columns there, that that is referring to things that are going to take place anyway, despite whether we want them to or not. OK, so despite whether humanity does embark on transcension or doesn't, the Caesarea, which is the end of the cosmos, will take place either way. OK, so these are things that are going to happen whether we like them or not, okay? Whether we choose for them to happen or not. Uh, and of course, there's so much more to get into with that. Um, 
I think ultimately I will do, you know, a full video just looking at the major asterisk mechanism three. Uh, it would be too much for this one video, but I think it definitely deserves one. And I'll, and I'll do that. You know, I've done it for the other me mechanisms. So, um, but that just gives you kind of overview, doesn't it, of um, what, you know, that type of mechanism is speaking about. And you should notice that, you know, there are various different concepts there that we've spoken about already in this lecture. And that's how they feed into this gigantic diagram uh, of um, the astrosoteriology and astroscatology. okay? Uh, and as we go on, I'm hoping to do more of these types of um, mechanisms. I think they're really helpful. I think they really demonstrate the complexity of transcension. You know, I think a few people maybe at the beginning might have thought, well, how complex can it really be? Well, this is how complex it is. And the major astronomist mechanism here should show you, uh, should demonstrate to you how complex transcension is, okay? And how important it is as well. So now we're going to be moving on to sort of the second half of the lecture, really, and this is sort of the shorter part, really. Uh, and this comes to what we call the intendance of transcension. So we've spoken about We've spoke about what transcension is, we've spoken about the different aspects of it, the different things that might influence transcension, why we might want to engage with transcension and embark upon it as individuals or as a humanity as a whole. But now we are coming back to kind of that original concept that I was talking about earlier, the plan of transcension, and ultimately the fact that, um, that I believe that transcension needs to be managed that transcension ultimately is something that is, um, you know, that it is not inevitable. If you look there at the top, astronist philosophy rejects any notion stating that transcension is inevitable. No, in my understanding, comitanic understanding uh, is that transcension is evitable. It is something that is not guaranteed to occur and that a lot of things need to take place in order for it to occur and that transcension needs to be undertaken with careful management by the astronist institution of course and by all astronauts as well um okay and so managing transcension is what we refer to as intendance or the intendance of transcension okay this is a huge topic that is you know, um, a whole other branch really of analypsology, because it's not looking at what transcension is, it's looking at how it is being managed. Um, and the whole reason why I believe that transcension is evitable is because of the doctrine of scope. Although indeed humanity has the potential to achieve transcension as is signaled by the, the occurrence of the scope of man, the existence of scope itself, meaning opportunity, means that transcension is not guaranteed because we have the opportunities, but those opportunities could dry up. We might not always have the same degree of opportunities in the future. We don't know whether the scope that we have now will always be there. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's it's not it's not inevitable. It's not guaranteed. We're not guaranteed to experience transcension in this way. OK, and so there are many different opinions on the sort of inevitability, the evitability of transcension and, 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 and how transcension is managed and whether it needs to be managed or whether you can just let it go and, and it will happen anyway. You know, there's different opinions on that. And of course, this is not dogma. Uh, it is only doctrine. Uh, so it is not incontrovertible. But of course, I believe in certain things and I'm presenting this. So there are alternative ideas like an unmanaged transcension, like I just said, you know, leaving transcension to do as it wishes, leaving it to, you know, um, happen if it happens, you know, that type of idea, you know, not trying to force it or manage it to happen. Okay. Um, 
And so, and then there's all there is other things like the idea that transcension, transcension is destined, and so therefore is definite to occur. These types of ideas, of course, emerge when we're thinking about um, an unmanaged transcension. Okay, so the, there's those two competing philosophies really on 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 the intendants and and how transcension is to be uh, to be approached. Okay. I've already spoken earlier a little bit about extrication and the idea that, you know, this is a very different approach to salvation. And it's the idea, of course, that, that you know, unlike in any other religions uh, where some other entity brings about salvation, such as God, in astronism, humanity must save itself. It must bring about its own salvation. And although indeed there exists the concept of intervenience, and although scope and other complements may be regarded by some astronists as having been divinely bestowed, um, ultimately achieving transcension is contingent on human action. Okay. Um, and this is the difference. Again, I'll reiterate that, you know, in Christianity, Jesus brought about salvation through this crucifixion and resurrection. Um, that is not the same in astronism that those events have not occurred, events that have not occurred in astronism to bring that about for us. So therefore, humanity has to bring those about for itself. And that's the, the essence, really, of this idea of, of extrication. Um, extrication is therefore the word we use to refer to this action or process by which humanity potentializes itself to achieve its own salvation. And therefore, also related to this is the term recoursement, which is used to denote humanity's duty and obligation to initiate and complete its own salvation. So it's the idea, you know, that we are obligated to do this, that we have a duty to do this. You know, we've been we've been given the scope of man. We've been given the opportunity, the intelligence to do this, the potential to do this. And it's our obligation to fulfill that. And that's what we refer to as recoursement. OK. I think I've never also also made it uh, clear that I've always made it clear that that astronism is a great struggle and uh, sorry, transcension is a great struggle and it will be the greatest struggle for humanity. This is not something that will be easy. This is something that will cost lives. It will cost resources. It will cost kind of everything that humanity has, it will cost in all different ways, mentally, physically, um, financially as well. And we're seeing that, of course, with space exploration, as we're speaking about right now, you know, only billionaires at the moment or governments are able to engage with space exploration at the moment. So think about all the money and resources that are already being conducted in terms of um, just space exploration. And then think about that in terms of what we want to achieve with transcension. You know, you start to understand then the degree of struggle that this will be. Um, and again, that's another reason why I think that this needs to be to be managed, why transcension needs to be managed, why it needs something there to to guide it. Um, and this is what we call the sidereal economy or the economy of transcension. This is the Astronist Institution's management of transcension. Um, and, it, and it really, it's, it's trying to bring about transcension through an economy um, of um, scope, a, a, an economy of opportunity. Um, and also, the work of the Astronist Institution is to establish and get this economy going, you know, Bring, bringing about scope and all these types of things. This is what I'm referring to when I say economy. I'm not just talking about monetary um, elements here. I'm talking about spiritual, mystical, intellectual, all these different aspects. These bring about the sidereal economy. And the economy works in that eventually it works to bring about a transcension and it needs to manage though. So again, reiterating that idea of a managed transcension, the intendants, okay? So one of the last parts of this section, I think, is this idea of the ele elevation of man. And this is a major astronist doctrine, and it's from the interdoxical period. And it really speaks about the significant task. It kind of builds on that previous slide, you know, thinking about the struggle that transcension is. Um, it's, it's speaking about the significant task uh, 
of astronism astro centralizing humankind meaning to literally lift or elevate human humanity upwards for the purpose of transcension this is what we refer to as the elevation of man or elevationism or the elevationist doctrine we've got a lot of different alternative ways of referring to this um and of course, indeed, once the elevation of man is complete and the grand world has been created, the issue of perpetuation will remain. You know, how long can we keep transcension going um, for us long enough to realize and then attain the ultimation? You know, there's a lot of things that need to take place. And can we keep it going for long enough before we become extinct? Um, this is the type of things that we're referring to later on in that, um, uh, a lot further down the line, um, in terms of the chronology of, of transcension. Uh, this is uh, what we're referring to uh, with the elevation of man and then, and then the perpetuation of it. You know, once we've achieved transcension, can we keep it going uh, for long enough, obviously, to ultimately achieve the ultimation. Um, so just as we begin to come to an end of this lecture now, hopefully you've got a better understanding of transcension, the different aspects of it. Uh, it's very hard to try and encompass it in just one lecture. It's very, very difficult. Uh, I do understand that these are very new ideas that they maybe sound very radical, strange, weird. Uh, we use new words, weird words maybe, uh, but this is astronism. This is the astronist beliefs. And of course, you've got to try and understand from our perspective, this is you know what, what we believe and what I believe, and this is what I will continue to explore. So the after effects of analypsology now for section four, I would say there's two major ones. I'd say there's two major after effects of analepsology, the discipline of analepsology. And the first is analepsocentrism. So analepsocentrism is a worldview similar to things like theocentrism or cosmocentrism. Uh, and it basically puts transcension at the top of the agenda. It prioritizes transcension, essentially. Um, and... We kind of saw that a little bit earlier on when I was speaking about analytic agency, if you remember, the idea that, you know, God and things like that, those kind of concepts are for transcension. They are agents of transcension. Uh, this is coming from an analypsocentric point of view, one that places transcension at the forefront of religion, philosophy, spirituality. Um, and of course, in the last year, particularly in 2021, um, I and astronism as a whole has become very much more analypsocentric than before than before than in the omnidoxy especially uh transcension was mentioned in the omnidoxy but not uh in as much detail and certainly not in as much of a central capacity as it is now and especially so in the astrodoxy in the upcoming astrodoxy um so of course we've got this analypsocentrism worldview which places and it, it kind of makes astronism out to be kind of a transcension religion. You know, transcension is the sort of goal of astronism now, and it's it's become very much the central essence of it. Um, even other dogmas like astrosis and cosmosis, they are all connected to transcension. So transcension and therefore the ultimation itself have become, you know, dogmas, and they have become so important to how we kind of understand astronism in 20 coming towards you know the end of 2021 and, and going into 2022 and then the second after effect of of the developing of of transcension and analypsology is what i refer to as analytical ethics or analytics which is the branch of analypsology that considers ethical questions of that are involved with transcension you know things like um you know what acts may be considered ethical under the banner of transcension and which are not which which acts may be considered um justified by by the endeavor of transcension and which are not uh, a major question regarding that is terraforming um you know if we go into outer space and we need to terraform a planet in order to progress humanity to progress the transcension 
could that be something that we, um, you know, the ethical aspects of that, could they, of, of, of terraforming, could they put an obstacle in, in the way of, of, of transcension? Or does the banner of transcension and, and doing things for transcension trump some of those ethical questions? And this is what analytical ethics wants to try and understand. It's essentially the ethics of transcension. You know, is transcension right? Is transcension good? Is transcension moral or is it immoral? And what are the limits of transcension in terms of it, of, of, of its ethicality? Um, you know, how can an act be justified through transcension is another is another idea. And, 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 and ideas like uh, transcensional act and uh, banner of transcension are, are things that I'm going to be exploring in my upcoming treatise, The Astrodoxy, uh, because I think they're really important. Understanding the ethics behind transcension is just as important in understanding what transcension is and how we may go about um, achieving it. So that comes to the end of this lecture on analypsology. I understand there's probably a lot, uh, that a lot of maybe a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, um, possibly a lot of um, uh, maybe challenges to what I've said. Um, a lot of uh, perhaps uh, def definitely hesitancy as to what I've what I've just said in this lecture. But maybe just let it digest. Let these ideas digest in your mind comment down below I, if you you know with your feedback on what you think of this sort of idea of transcension as a form of, of salvation and 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 what you think of it in terms of its role in astronism and whether it should play such a central role um, and also please also think about uh, kind of the sort of process of transcension and, and how you think it should be undertaken um, and, and, and uh, kind of how you see transcension maybe going in the future. And that's, that's what's most interesting to me. Um, you know, at the moment, I, I'm the main person who is developing these types of ideas. There's other people that I know are interested in these, um, but they don't seem to have the confidence that I do because obviously, you know, I've created these ideas. I've received these ideas. I've uh, a mixture of them. Uh, I've, I've created and, and received these ideas from the astronomical world. And, and, and when, when it is something that's very close to my heart, some of the people don't want to kind of get involved in that, but I don't want that to be the case. I want people to feel like they can um, develop transcension in their own way. Um, not too far, obviously. I don't want them to change the essence of it. Um, you know, this is my beliefs and I don't want them to change too much. Uh, I want the essence of it to stay. And I think ultimately, just to end, I think that's why I've created and, and designated astronism as a dogma, because I think the essence of it is incontrovertibly true. I, I do believe that. And I, I think it is incontrovertible. I think that this is the way forward for humanity that the astronomical world and space exploration are certainly the ways that we're going to achieve salvation and the ultimate condition of humanity. Um, and hopefully as transcension continues, as we explore it more, as the discipline of analypsology develops more, we'll gain a better understanding of what transcension is and how we may go about it. Okay, I'm going to stop there and uh, I'm going to say thank you for listening to this episode of A Conversation with Comitan and I will uh, see you in the next episode. So thank you all for listening and goodbye.